North Carolina and Tennessee and places like that, if any of you have been there. My son happens to be allergic to chiggers, and that's really tough on him. All right, well, we're looking forward to a good weekend together tonight and all day tomorrow. I hope you don't have anywhere special to go. I hope you can come here. We're going to be here all day and uh, spend the Sabbath day together. Just a heads up, you saw, you saw me wearing a mask. Our family will be wearing masks this weekend. We travel to a lot of places. We're in a new congregation and a new state almost every week. And uh, we have been in, ch in churches where they've had some outbreaks recently. Uh, this isn't over yet. And what the, la the last thing we want to do is to have a little bug hitchhike with us and catch one of you. We want you to be just as healthy when we leave as when we got here. So that's what we're going to do and follow that practice, uh, one of our protocols, if you want to call it that. All right, we're ready to study the Word of God. Do you have your Bible with you? Let's start with a text, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, starting with verse 39. And by the way, your pastor's wife told me I must not wear a coat tonight, so I'm following her orders. Don't blame me, blame her. <laughs> Taking off my coat tonight. Luke chapter 12, beginning with verse 39. And this know, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would, have, would come, he would have watched and not have suffered the house, his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now how's that possible? Seventh-day Adventists know very well what's coming down the line. There are going to, be, uh, going to be persecution. There are going to be Sunday laws. There are going to be plagues falling. How can we possibly be surprised when the Lord Jesus comes back to this earth. Maybe this verse is not talking about the second coming of the Lord. Maybe it's talking about the coming of the latter reign of the Holy Spirit that might catch us by surprise. Because there are not that many signs that precede that. Heart readiness in our lives is the only real sign of the time of the Holy Spirit. So there are two comings of, the, of God in the last days, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's the first one that I think we might be surprised by. And by the way, preparing for the Holy Spirit may be the most important preparation we make because without the seal of God, of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to be ready for the second coming of Christ. It is the Holy Spirit's coming that prepares us to meet Jesus when he comes and not call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on us. So this might be the most important coming that we have to deal with because this is the time that we need to be sealed with the Holy Spirit so we can go through what's coming. Well, Christ spoke of ten virgins, didn't he? They were all preparing for the coming of, of, the, of the bridegroom. But five of them had pre made preparations and the other hadn't. And they were pretty satisfied. They were there. They were ready for the bridegroom to come. But they didn't have the oil. And you know what the oil represents in scripture? The Holy Spirit. They simply were not prepared for that coming. And that's such a direct parallel for us today. And then God also speaks of us as Laodicea. What's Laodicea all about? We think we're okay. We, have, we know the prophecies. We know what's coming. And uh, we're just very careless. We settled, we're, we, we're just settled into our normal procedure. I'm going to read you a couple of statements from Ellen White's writings that we need to really be serious about. Desire of Ages, page 634. Had the Church of Christ done her appointed work, the Lord Jesus would have come to our earth in power and great glory. Now what church is she talking about? The church of her day. This Desire of Ages was written in the 1890s. 
had the Church of Christ done her appointed work, we would be in heaven, is what she said. That happened to me my great-grandfather's generation. He was, believe it or not, a delegate to the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference in that famous year. And uh, so it was his generation that should have been translated to heaven without seeing death. But we're still here, aren't we? Because of another statement in Evangelism, page 696, it is the unbelief, the worldliness, unconsecration, and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Let's not be blaming the Lord for the delay. The blame is ours. And I say ours because, yes, we weren't there in the 1890s, but we have been pretty comfortable too. We thought we were ready just like they did. And uh, the unbelief and the worldliness and the con unconsecration and the strife, tragic reality that there has to be strife among God's people in God's church. All right. The reason for the existence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Would you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 7? And we can read exactly what our purpose is in these verses. Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse 1. And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascend. By the way, we happen to be living in that verse. You're all aware of that, aren't you? We're living in the days of the held winds. Yes, there's difficulty. Yes, there are problems. Yes, there's all th sorts of things happening. But we're still functioning pretty normally. We can still go to the bank, put a little card in, get some money out. That day is coming to an end when the winds are loosed. So we're living in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. Now I'm going to interrupt right there. Until what? Until the Pope does something really bad in Rome. Or until the Supreme Court makes a terrible decision. Or until the President of the United States does something horrendous. Is that what it says? It doesn't even hint at bad things happening by people that we can't control. Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The seal of God must be placed in your forehead, not on your forehead, in your mind, the frontal lobes of your brain. Loyalty, surrender, obedience to God, or else there will be no second coming in our lifetime, just like there wasn't in my great-grandfather's lifetime. The seal of God is the issue for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. That's why we were called into existence. Yes, it's great that we can win souls. I belong to Amazing Facts, a soul-winning organization. Your pastor has held many evangelistic meetings, and we need to be doing that. But if we baptize 20 million more people than we have today and don't receive the seal of God in our foreheads, we have failed as a church. The seal of God is why God called this movement into existence. Yet this simple truth is one of the most opposed truths in Adventism today, that the seal of God is what is delaying the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, we've read a couple of statements there that are kind of, one is uh, they're, they're discouraging because the Lord hasn't come yet, but the reality is there has to be a, a, a sequence of events what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share with you parts of an articulate attack on the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church from within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm going to share with you just a little bit of it so you get the flavor. We drift to believing we influence the determined time of the return of, Jesus, of Christ, believing we have delayed his return, 
or can hasten his return. Thus we drift from believing his coming is so near that we are the last generation to believe that we may become by our own efforts the last generation. We determine within ourselves to be a people of a special quality, a distinct people like the world has never before known fit for the return of Christ. Ellen White does not call for a supposed higher spiritual nature of God's people. There is no reference to the human moral condition being determinative. Believing we become the last generation by our own spiritual performance produces a focus on ourselves. Inevitably, such a focus leads us to moralism and perfectionism as ends in themselves and as substitutes for faith and humble proclamation of the grace of God. My friends, I have just read nine serious errors of last day Adventist theology in the last five minutes. Nine serious errors. Did you catch them? Number one, it talked about the determined time of the return of Christ. We have nothing to say about it. Delay or hasten. The determined time of the return of Christ is a serious theological error if we believe inspiration. Number two, believing that we have delayed his return is simply not true. It's a determined time. But didn't we read just a moment ago, Desire of Ages 634, that said that we, by our unbelief and unconsecration and strife, have delayed the coming of Christ for 130 years? We just read that, Desire of Ages 634. Number three, we may become by our own efforts the last generation. Please, our own efforts, how far do our own efforts get us anytime, anywhere? Our own efforts is never the, the way that we get to be the last generation. We'll find out how we can in a moment. Number four, it referred to, this article referred to a special quality, a distinct people. But isn't that exactly what it will take to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator, without a forgiver of sins? Isn't it going to take a special quality of Christ dwelling in us for that to happen? Number five, it referred to a supposed higher spiritual nature that we must have. Well, I could spend the next hour and a half just quoting statements from inspiration, both the Bible and the writings of Ellen White, that talk about a higher spiritual nature that we all need to have, in which we act and live and talk like Christ. Number six, it referred to our own spiritual performance, kind of like a show, we're performing. Now, where is that coming from? Number seven, the focus is on ourselves. That makes it sound like self-righteousness and Phariseeism, and we don't want that. Our own focusing on ourselves. Number eight, it referred to moralism and perfectionism. Oh, it's so easy to label any desire to become like Christ in character perfectionism, and you don't want that because you just, that's very negative. So just labeling terms to switch the emphasis can be very dangerous. And number nine, it referred to substitutes for faith. Really? Is believing in victory over sin a substitute for faith or the highest goal of faith? What God can do. For years, I'm afraid to say, there has been a determined attack on this primary mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm gonna share with you what that mission is as best I can tell to prepare a people ready to receive the seal of God, number one, then the latter rain, and giving the final message to this entire world by God's grace and power. That's part of our mission. Giving us power to overcome all sin in our lives. That's part of the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. To live without any sin during the seven last plagues. There is no forgiveness after the close of probation. We must be knowing how to do that today if we have any chance of living after the close of probation without sin. And finally, this last generation has a one job in mind, to tell the universe, not just this world, 
but to every watching being in the universe, the power of God, vindicating his name, vindicating his law, vindicating his government. That's our mission. That's why we were called into existence. A whole bunch of things all linked together. And I believe that we need to know our mission carefully. Well, if we're willing to reject, as we definitely should, this Satan-inspired attempt that I've just read to you to discredit the divinely given message and mission of the remnant church, if we will choose to believe, if we will believe that God did not make a mistake when he made promises that, that are higher than the highest human thought can reach, I don't know about you, but that victory over all sin is higher than my human thought can reach, but God made that promise then the only question left if we're going to believe God's promises is how. How can we be part of such an impossible dream? And Jesus told us how. Would you turn to Luke chapter 8? The answer is found in, a, in the midst of a storm on the Sea of Galilee. You know the story very well. Luke 8, verses 24 and 25. He's sleeping. The storm is going on, but he's sleeping. And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. Don't you even care? You're, we're going down, and you're not even thinking about us. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? That's the issue, folks. The question for us today, where is our faith in the word of God and the promises of God? Will we spend the rest of our days in pious apology for failing to do what he says we can and should do? Well, my, it was just my nature. Uh, the, it was the circumstances. And we apologize for our sins against God. Will we continue to refuse to believe that all his biddings are enablings? What he asks us to do, he will produce if we let him. The answer to how has always been and always will be Faith. Faith. Faith kept Jesus from sin. Faith kept Jesus from yielding to Satan's temptations. The faith of Jesus produced the character of Jesus. His faith. This little statement from Desire of Ages, page 389. As the Son of God lived by faith in the Father, so are we to live by faith in Christ. So fully was Jesus surrendered to the will of God that the Father alone appeared in his life. The Father alone appeared in the life of Jesus. When they saw Jesus, they saw God's character. They saw God in his revelation to human beings. Now God is not asking us to have the faith of Abraham or the faith of Moses. He's asking us to have the faith of Jesus the faith of Jesus. It will take the faith of Jesus to withstand the assaults of Satan in these last days, I guarantee you. That same faith in his heavenly Father. Where is your faith is the question he asks of this last generation. Out of the large group who sing and pray about the soon coming of the Lord, there will come a smaller group, we're told that in inspiration, a smaller group who will understand Jesus' question, where is your faith? And will live by that faith. So what is the faith of Jesus? It's the heart certainty that whatever God says, we want to do. Whatever he says, even if we can't understand why. Faith of Jesus was faith even when Jesus thought the Father was abandoning him on Calvary. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? But he's held on because he knew that the Father would work it out. Biblical faith knows that God can be trusted. 
Faith is the whole person saying yes to God and obeying whatever rules he sees fit to give us without complaining, questioning, or rationalizing. If God said it, that's enough for us. Faith is the opposite of sin. It simply is. Faith is power and vigor and living as Christ did. I want to take you to another Bible text, 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5 and verse 4. You know this one by memory, I'll bet. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Faith, trust, believing, not knowledge, not trying harder, that's what overcomes Satan. Faith overcomes Satan. Just like David and Goliath or any story of the Old Testament that we've fallen in love with. Christ demonstrated that when faith connects with divine power, men and women can live without sinning. That's possible. Higher than the highest human thought, remember? Either sin is destroyed by faith or it will destroy us. There are no other options. Either faith will destroy sin or sin will destroy us. Only when his people reveal faith in his power will they be able to take the gospel to the world effectually. When we, can, when we believe that he can do it, not us. They will show that faith is the difference maker between a nominal Christianity and a trusting, over, overcoming Christian, a living Christian. Here's an amazing statement. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. Let me reread that. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. That's what faith is all about. Review and Herald, March 10, 1904. It is faith that gets us into heaven. It is faith that gives us victory over sin. It is faith, always faith. God is waiting for men and women of faith, like Enoch and Elijah. They were men of faith. And their lives teach us that heaven will translate no one unless he or she has become an overcomer. Another statement. The godly character of Enoch represents the state of holiness which must be attained by those who shall be redeemed from the earth at the time of Christ's second advent. Patriarchs and Prophets, 88 and 89. Enoch's character represents the state of holiness which must be attained by us if we're going to receive the seal of God. Another statement. For his faithful obedience to God, he, Enoch, was translated. So also the faithful who are alive and remain will be translated. Same faith as Enoch had, same faith needed today. Testimonies, Volume 2, 122. So I say this. Some generation, some generation of church members will become God's faithful last generation. Some generation will. I just hope it's us. I just want it to be us and not another hundred year delay. Amen. They will not only say yes to everything God says, they will demonstrate the quality of what happens to people who say yes to God. Not a rebel will exist among them. Not one. They are men and women of faith. What I'm going to do right now is something that I have fun doing. I have missed the friendship of the one who called me to become part of Amazing Facts over the last 35 years. We've had a, such a marvelous time with Amazing Facts over these years. And Joe Cruz was a special person. People sometimes said he was rigid and unbending. Oh, he was just the opposite of that. He was the easiest person to talk to you could ever imagine. We always relished the fact, this was back in the days when uh, 
when Amazing Facts was headquartered in uh, Frederick, Maryland. And uh, the only time I saw Joe Cruz was once a year when, we, when our trip took us around the corner of the United States and we had a little time to spend in Maryland before we went on with our other meetings. And we treasured those times. They were very special times. Joe Cruz had some interesting comments on this subject that I'm going to share with you just as he said them. Every day with Jesus should be sweeter than the day before. Each moment should find us moving up in our experience to a deeper faith. This very moment he wants to lead us deeper into the waters of surrender and consecration. There are still victories to be won, sins to be put away, and a drawing together that needs to be accomplished by the Holy Spirit. Do we need that? Do we need that drawing together of the Holy Spirit's power? Desperately need that. Many are afraid of that word perfect. They are fearful that God will ask them to do something they are not willing to do. But now we come face to face with the basic weakness that has led millions into discouragement and defeat. They simply have not been reconciled to giving up the enjoyment of their sins. That's how Joe Cruz talked. And that's exactly right. Until that choice is made and acted upon, there can be no real victory over sin. I'm convinced, he said, that there are only two possible reasons for a person holding back. Either he or she is not willing to give up the enjoyment of the sin, or else does not believe that God can give deliverance from it. Two reasons. Self is our greatest enemy. Once we have settled the score with that old man of the flesh who seeks to rule over us, all the other victories will come in their course. God has given everyone a powerful and personal weapon to use in combating the self. The will. Ah, the will. That's not willpower. We don't have any willpower. That was gone when Adam sinned. But the will, the power of choice, is maybe the only thing we have left from the Garden of Eden. We certainly don't have bodies. We certainly don't have minds like they did. But we still have the freedom to choose and the power to make choices for God if we are willing. The will, everything, depends on the right action of this resource. Many are not willing to admit the true cause behind the raging conflict. The truth is that God wants something that self is not willing to give up. They love something more than they love God. We also need to admit that we fight a spiritual enemy who is stronger than we are. In the weakness of our flesh, the harder we try, the deeper we sink into the mire. Have you found that to be true? The harder you try, the seems like the worse it gets. We have no natural ability to keep our thoughts and imagination under control. Imagination. Oh, my. That's the world where we live all by ourselves, where no one else can look in. The real world that we live in, that imagination. Without the transforming grace of the new birth, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. The mind renewed by Jesus Christ holds the only answer to true victory. I thought that was just a marvelous little short statement by the founder of Amazing Facts. Dead on, dead right. I found a unique statement in Signs of the Times, August 26, 1897. Listen to this. Every faculty that we possess has been provided for us in Christ. A spark of God's own life has been breathed into the human body, making man a living soul, the possessor of moral endowments, and a will to direct his own course of action. Did you catch that? A spark of God's own life has been given to you to me, to every single human being on the face of this earth, a spark of God's own life, making man a living soul, able to make choices, the possessor of moral endowments. Do you have a conscience? Do you have something that tells you innately what's right and what's wrong? That's the spark of God's life in your soul. And every man and woman has been given this spark, not one exempted. So everyone can make an intelligent choice for God and for truth 
and for righteousness. Well, people are scared to death at the teaching that we will develop perfect characters before Jesus comes. That is a very threatening concept. John Wesley, John Wesley brought to the forefront the gospel's power to give victory over sin. We were not the first ones to come up with that idea. This came well before us. John Wesley met a lot of opposition during his time. One of his greatest opponents was a man with a big name, Count von Zinzendorf. Now that's a name, isn't it? Count von Zinzendorf. In commenting upon Zinzendorf's views, Wesley wrote this. There is scarcely an expression in Holy Writ which has given more offense than this. The word perfect is what many cannot bear. The very sound of it is an abomination to them. And whosoever preaches perfection that is obtainable in this life runs great hazard of being counted by them worse than a heathen man or a publican. Still speaking of Count von Zinzendorf, Wesley continued, No, says the great man, the Count. This is an error of errors. I hate it from my heart. I pursue it through all the world with fire and sword, this idea that you can overcome sin. Wow. And in response, Wesley said, I say, why so vehement? Why are those who oppose salvation from sin so eager? In God's holy name, why are you so fond of sin? What has it ever done for you? What good is it ever likely to do for you in this world or in the world to come? And why are you so violent against those who hope for a deliverance from it? I thought that was an interesting response. Why are you fighting what God can do for you? What good has sin done in your life? Can't you believe God's word and take it as he said it? The final generation of saints will, will reflect the character of Christ, not for human glorification. Look at me, I'm better than everyone else. Not for a moment, but for the glorification of their Lord. Any claims which deny that God has the power to give victory in the life of the holy surrendered person is an attack upon his character, his promises, and his word. And there is a problem here. Usually we think of the biggest and most important question, am I right with God, am I going to heaven? We say that's the most important question we can ask, but I don't think it is. When man's salvation is made the center of the gospel, we start looking at ourselves a lot more than we should. We start looking at our abilities, we start looking at what our strong points are, and his glory tends to be secondary. When the most important question that we ask is, am I assured of my salvation? I say the word I is too big in that sentence. Am I going to heaven? Our focus needs to be away from me to Christ. Am I telling the truth about Christ? Am I living God's way? Am I doing it as God wants me to? Is my life glorifying God? That should be our question. No matter what happens to us, is my life glorifying God? Am I telling and living the truth about his character? Are, are, are his requests and his commands a joy and a delight for us to follow? Now what I want to do for a moment or two, I want you to get your Bible again and look up with me Romans chapter 7. That is a very interesting chapter. Romans chapter 7. This chapter is the one most often used to deny the possibility of living a perfectly obedient life. This chapter. The man of Romans 7, and the whole thing is the, the man of Romans 7, he's not a hypocrite. He's sincere. He's earnest. But he's not converted. That's the problem of the man of Romans 7. Romans 7 describes a very classic legalist trying to do hard, better, trying to get it right. He desires victory. He strives with all his human effort to get it right, but he meets with failure. Let's read some of the verses. Romans 7, verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. In other words, I don't want to do it. 
And what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Verse 18. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Haven't we all felt like that at some point? That just... We're trying, trying, and we're failing, and we're feeling like a hypocrite. Romans 7 is describing a very classic experience of humanity. But I want you to hold your finger there. We're coming back. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And let's compare Romans 7 with Galatians chapter 2. Now remember in Romans 7:17 7, it said, Now then it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwelleth in me. So I've got sin dwelling in me. But now Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My friends, Romans 7 and Galatians 2 are two totally different experiences. One is trying harder and failing. One is letting, the whole, letting us be crucified. A.T. Jones used to say, do you feel like you're about dying today? Then go ahead and die. Just die to all of your selfish desires and just die and let Christ come and raise you up. That's the way they talked back then, 130 years ago. But right now, we need to have that crucified with Christ experience so that Christ can live within us. Two entirely different experiences that we're talking about right here. Only total dependence on Christ can ever bring perfection of character. The legalist suffers with fears and failures and disappointments and frustration. And some, some just give it up completely. Well, if I'm lost, I'll, be just, I'll, I'll do whatever I want to do. I'll enjoy the pleasures this world has to offer. Others hold on to that faint hope that maybe someday, maybe someday in the future, we'll get it right and we won't feel guilty anymore. Neither of those do very well. Now the man of Romans 7, if you want to just look back at that for a moment, the man of Romans 7 asked a very important question in verse... ...24. Romans 7, verse 24. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? from the body of this death. Who shall deliver me? That's the question. And the answer is right in the next verse. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the only hope for the man of Romans 7. For us. We've all experienced that. We have got to be delivered through Jesus Christ our Lord. And just by the way, some people say, some people teach that Romans 7 is the highest experience we'll ever have in this life. We want to do the right thing, but we don't. We don't want to do bad things, but we do them. And that's the way it is until Jesus comes. But look at very carefully, Romans 7 verse 14. It says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Does that sound like a good experience to strive for? I am carnal, sold under sin. In the next chapter, verse 6, he says, to be carnally minded is death. So Romans 7 can't be an advice statement to us. It has to be a statement of failure, of disappointment. It can't be something good that we are given to understand. In Romans 8, now in Romans 8, there is a transformation because Christ has become the center of this man's life. Look what it says in verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. And then verse 1, There is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. You see, we're either under the law of sin and death, trying harder but failing and just being guilty all the time, either under that law, 
or the law of the spirit of life in Jesus Christ. There are no, two, no, no other option. One or the other. The former are carnally minded, the latter are spiritually minded. Nowhere in scripture has the contrast between human effort alone and God's power been more clearly demonstrated than Romans 7 and Romans 8. Romans 8 ends in this experience, verse 38, chapter 8, verse 38. I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that? Amen. With all your heart? I'm asking for your whole heart on this one that neither life nor death nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God. If we have faith, the faith of Jesus, that will be our experience. We can have that joyful experience of walking with Christ. Now, one of the greatest fears about the doctrine of perfection is that it concentrates solely on behavior. We read that in that earlier statement I read as we began. That doesn't provide assurance for God's people of salvation. Well, I'll tell you something, and this I've got to just say straight up. There should not be assurance of salvation for someone who is disobeying God. There just shouldn't. There should be a fear. There should be a, an anxiety there that should drive us to the foot of the cross. That's what guilt is all about. I'm not talking about false guilt that everything you do you feel bad about. I'm talking about real guilt that our conscience tells us we are messing our lives up badly. That is a blessing from God. That's the Holy Spirit. And it drives us to our knees. That's what its purpose is. We are wanting a better experience. So let's talk about what God's faith can do for us in the book of Hebrews. Let's try another text. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. You want assurance? This is how to get it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of what? Faith. That's what our assurance is. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. In full assurance of faith believing that what God says he will accomplish, believing that there is something better than to just trying and failing and trying and regretting and frustration. There is something better than that. There is something that, God's, that God offers. God's loyal people, his last day people, who have known sin and abomination in our lives, we've all known it. We don't like it. But we've received the power of the gospel and we've washed our robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In all his strength and courage, we move forward, trusting God, facing every crisis, every difficulty, every test that comes to an individual or to a church with full assurance of the strength of Christ that will get us through this whole thing and we can accomplish his purpose. Now one more thing on this whole issue. In recent times, with all of our doctrinal controversies that have been going on for the last 30, 40 years, there have been strong cries for unity, and unity is a very important thing. But let's read what Jesus said about unity. Back in the book of John, the book of John, Jesus' last counsel to his disciples before he was crucified. By the way, that chapter is chapter 17. It is a wonderful chapter. John chapter 17. Look at verse 17. Sanctify them, in other words, make them holy, through what? Thy truth. Not error. Not compromise. Thy word is truth. Look at verse 19. And for, thy, for their sakes I, Jesus said, sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified 
through the truth. My friends, if truth is not pulling us together, there can be no unity. It's compromise, and it will always fail. Truth is the only thing that can pull us together. Every other call is a call for counterfeit unity. The world is calling for that right now. Can you just believe what we have seen in our lifetime? That's not covering too many years, is it? In our lifetime, we have seen Roman Catholics and Evangelical Baptists coming together to save our nation. And they do it by ignoring truth on both sides. But they say, we'll have one purpose in mind. We'll get the right people elected. We'll get the right laws passed. And then the nation will be safe. By ignoring truth. And just making compromise after compromise after compromise. That's counterfeit unity. We've watched it happen in our United States of America. And we've seen that it doesn't produce good results if what I'm watching in my country is any guide of what's happening right now. I found a very fascinating statement in Sanctified Life, page 85. Unity is the sure result of Christian perfection. Let me read that again. Unity is the sure result of Christian perfection. So unity is not a goal. It is not something we strive for. It is the natural result of Christian perfection being worked out in our lives. Romans 8, what we just read. Unity will come if truth and growth is God's way of doing things. One last text for tonight. I've told you what I really hope and believe will be our experience. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning with verse 13. This is a powerful passage. Till we all come in the what of the faith? Unity. Unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto what? A perfect man. And that includes women, of course. This is gender not specific unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We have seen a lot of that in recent years from within the church, not just outside the church. From within God's remnant people, cunning craftiness, lying in wait to deceive. But, verse 15, speaking the truth in love. Catch that? It is not the truth in anger. It is not the truth to prove someone wrong. Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him into all things, which is the head, even Christ. There's no other way to hasten the coming of Christ, my friends, than what I've just shared with you tonight. There is no other way to hasten his coming. And when I say hasten, I mean end the delay. Because we have not hastened anything. We have delayed everything in God's plan. But we can end that delay if we get serious about our relationship with Christ. We can end it. The sanctuary message is designed to lead us to justification and sanctification of God's people. Blotting out of sins. Do you remember the, the sanctuary message ended the whole sequence of the year with a cleansing experience? Every sin that had been committed for that whole year was blotted out, removed from the camp, and no more to be talked of at all. Done. Finished. Well, that happened every year, unfortunately. This time, it's going to happen just once. There will be a blotting out of sin in the record books of heaven, but you know, before the, the record books can be, cleared, can be cleared, this heart has to be cleansed of sin. We have to let God cleanse this heart of sin. Our attitudes, our feelings, our emotions, our judgments must not cloud our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uniting of men and women in truth will provide the impetus for Jesus to say, it's time. 
My people are ready to be sealed. Angels, loose the winds. We're going home. And we will. This generation has that opportunity. Yes, I know there was that opportunity way back then. Inspiration tells us that. But you know, inspiration hasn't told us of any other time period in our history when everything was ready to go again except at the very end of the prophecies of the book of Daniel and Revelation. And there we have signs. There we have evidence. Revelation 7, 1. The, winds are, the angels are holding the winds until God's people are ready for that sealing experience in which every sin can be blotted out forever. Never again to fall back into Romans 7. Ever, ever, ever. And all I want to say is, even so come, Lord Jesus. The delay is too much. We're all getting pretty tired of that. Remember, the whole church, Ellen White has told us, will not be converted. I wish it would be. 20 million saints moving as a militant army of God. But we are told it's not going to happen that way. The majority will forsake us. Have you read that one? The majority will forsake us. And that includes people that we sit and worship with. And they will become our most bitter enemies. And so, my friends, we're going to have to go through a time of Jacob's trouble, wrestling with God. She said, how few know what it is. We need to do some wrestling so that our hearts are right with God. And then, there is no reason at all that this shouldn't be the last generation. This generation does not need any more prophecies to be fulfilled. The last movements of prophecy will be so rapid, we'll see them happening every day in our newspapers or in our TV broadcasts, a new prophecy being fulfilled, and it won't take much more time. I say it could all happen within a few months' time, very easily. But it has to be starting with God's sealed people sealed and cleansed and right with him by faith, the faith of Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful that you have given us promises like this in your word. If it were not for these, we would give up hope completely because our track record individually and as a church is not good. And we are sorry for that. We are sorry that you, we have delayed your desire to take your people home much earlier than this. There should have been no World Wars I or II or terrorist attacks or anything that has happened in our lifetime. But we are grateful for your mercy, that you have not cast us off completely, that you are willing to give us another chance. May we not throw this one away. May this church right here be a beacon light of what it means to have faith, the faith of Jesus. I pray in his name. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, tomorrow, church time, we're going to talk about something that is very dear to my heart, the great controversy, the great struggle between Christ and Satan. If we get that straight, we pretty much will get everything straight about the Bible. I call it the last piece of the puzzle. You know what it's like when you're putting a, a picture puzzle together? And that last piece, you can't find it. You don't know where it is. Did someone lose it? You can't find that last piece. It's frustrating. We might just be the last piece of God's puzzle. And then in the afternoon, how will the lamb become a dragon. What will change in our United States of America to turn the lamb-like beast into a fire-breathing dragon? We'll talk about those things tomorrow. I hope you have nothing else planned on your agenda for tomorrow. I've got nothing else planned. I'm going to be here all day. And all right. And uh, we're just going to have a good day of fellowshipping together. So once again, thank you for coming. May God be with you in this special Sabbath day.